This is the Other 22 Hours Podcast. Hey, and welcome to this week's episode of the Other 22 Hours Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron schaefer Hayes, And I'm your host, Michaela Ann. If you're brand new, thank you for checking us out. And if you're a returning listener, thank you for joining us again. For those of you that are new, this isn't your typical music podcast where guests come on and talk about their latest record or maybe a tour they're about to leave on. We decided to call it the other 22 hours because we wanted to focus on the time that we as musicians are off stage and talk to our guests about the different tools and routines that they have found to keep balance and inspiration in their lives during the less than shiny mundane times. Between the two of us, Aaron and I have almost 25 years of experience in the music business. I've worked at labels, been a teacher of music, and spent the better part of the last decade writing and recording my own records and putting them out independently, as well as with record labels and touring the world. And I started making records with friends in high school and then spent a lot of years on the road with different bands and working as a sideman with a lot of different artists. And now I spend my time making records in my studio and with other producers and outside studios, and I also write music for TV. So through all of this, Michaela and I have realized that there's no one right way to create a career around your passion. And in an industry where so much feels out of our control, left up to luck, who you know, being in the right place at the right time, we wanted to focus on what is within our control. And so with that, we decided to invite our friends and some of our favorite artists on and ask them the question, what do you do to create sustainability in your life so that you can sustain your creativity? Today's guest is Layla McCalla, who is an incredible artist, cellist, singer, songwriter, and banjo player from New Orleans. She's Haitian-American, originally from the New York, New Jersey area, and she has toured the world, put out a couple different records, both incredibly rich, beautiful records, one called Very Colored Songs, which was made up of songs in tribute to Langston Hughes and her most recent record, Breaking the Thermometer. She was in the Carolina Chocolate Drops, and I personally met her almost eight years ago at this point when I had the great fortune of touring with her. So I've known her for a long time and was so excited to have her as our guest today. We were honored to have Layla on as a guest. She is a mother of three and takes on really large creative projects. Her last record, Breaking the Thermometer, she worked on for almost six years because it is a part of a theatrical production that she created with a team of people under commission from Duke University. And it was just an amazing conversation to start our day with today. We talked a lot about how being an artist as a profession can really question and challenge the social norms inherent in a capitalistic society. We talked about how living and demonstrating that lifestyle to the younger generation plants the seeds for fundamental social and societal change. Because of the way that Layla creates her art and does a lot of research behind her projects, we spent a lot of time talking about creating art to both gain an understanding of the world as well as to give voice to stories that have been minimized throughout history. This conversation probably ran a little shorter than some of our other conversations, but it was really dense and really amazing. So without further ado, here's our conversation with Layla McCalla. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. How are you this morning? I'm a little frizzle frazzled. My kids have professional development day. What does so that mean? their teachers are at school, but the kids stay home. And oh. I, you know, I'd assumed like, oh, Monday, it'll be great. So I have planned all these meetings for today. And then all of a sudden I had the kids this morning. And yeah. Yeah. I will say we had kind of a stressful morning set up yeah. for this. We were scrambling. And so all it just of this makes that sense. is going on it's is, like full yeah, circle. Is, is actually like yeah. Really great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's comforting. Yeah. This is working out. This is working out great yeah. on our end. You're so like, now we you. can relax. We had the whole plan of what we were going to start with, but I feel like, given how this started, I just want to jump to a different question of like, what is a typical day in your life mm-hmm. when you're not on tour promoting a record? So, like, when you're home, what does it look like? And do you even have a typical day, or is every day? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So I have my typical plan for how the day is supposed to go, and then life always gets right. in the way. Heard. And just because our listeners don't know all the things that we know, you have three mm-hmm. children. And what I have are three ages? children. My oldest daughter is eight and a half, and then I have two five-year-old, nearly five-year-old twins. I can't believe they're about to be five. I know. <laughs> that happened fast. Yeah. Yeah. So you start every morning with 
at least like a little bit of quiet time before they get yeah up get usually my it's so funny every single morning it's always my son Zaid wakes up first then my oldest daughter Delilah wakes up and then Zaid's twin Zaya wakes up and it's always in that order and I always wake them up in that order last week was rough because it was daylight savings and I just remember mm-hmm. my daughter's eyes saying, I'm sleepy. I'm sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like pitch black outside. And I'm like, I know. This is crazy. This is wrong. I'm with you, girl. Yeah. I'm with you. Um, <laughs> yeah. My cousin is a farmer and he has the same complaint because he's like, my cows don't care what time it is. So I have right, to get up right. regardless. They're doing away with it. Next year is supposedly the first year where we're not doing really? daylight savings. I perpetually hear that they're doing away with I, it. I hope so. Not all. Be. It's dumb. I never cared about it before, yeah. but now that we have a child, I'm like, this, this is, is this is wrong. Up. Yeah, I think <laughs> I saw a meme that was like, why don't they do it on a Monday at 4 p.m. instead of like Sunday at <laughs> two in the morning? <laughs> they were like, this yeah. is like punishment for parents, you know? Yeah. So anyway, I have to get my kids ready for school, and they all have to wear a uniform brush teeth, comb hair, make them look presentable, make sure they have all the stuff in their backpack, make sure we're like, have all the things that we need. Delilah has her school computer. And because everything is about the computer and like, you know, this kind of reality of having to be able to navigate technology and do all these like Mm -hmm. literacy apps. And honestly, I'm struggling with how much freaking work they give kids today. Yeah, at least at the school that we're at. You know, it's weird because I feel like I'm an artist. I care so much about arts as a part of education, but now I'm sending my kids to this school so that they have French language skills. And there's just not an integrated arts curriculum. It's so rigorous academically. Mm. And so, yeah, that's something that I've been, I just think about a lot is, is this the right thing? Plus, their school is 45 minutes away from our house. So I'm driving Mm -hmm. three hours a day to pick up, to drop off, come home, and then to go pick them up. And so there is a certain element of the daily routine that just feels unsustainable because it takes so long Mm -hmm. to get to school. And then like there's so much homework. This is the first year that I've been really pushing more extracurricular activities. Delilah just started playing the drum set, which has been really awesome. And it's so exciting to see her just light up and get into it and be inspired and have fun. I feel like there's so much kids can learn from music. But then she's also doing French tutoring and then her siblings are doing soccer on Tuesdays. And I'm just like, oh, my God. And then I'm playing a festival in Idaho this weekend. I'm just like, what the hell is life? And them speaking French is important because your family and their father's family. Exactly. Well, that's how it felt in the beginning. And now I'm just kind of like, oh, my God, does it have to come from school? What needs to come from school? Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a really challenging thing I'm learning, having a child, negotiating what do I think is best for Mm -hmm. them and what's best for us in our everyday Mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Our daughter goes to a little Montessori school and it is a further Mm -hmm. drive. And at first I was very much like, oh my God, but then we have less time. And I thankfully I still feel like we're in a position where Mm -hmm. it's worth it. But that constant like what parts of your life and your time do you sacrifice? Sacrifice for things that you think are benefiting your child. It's just like a constant weighing everything in negotiation. That's so much also mental energy yeah. and weighing like what's best for her parents. So then therefore we're able to be better parents versus what's best for her to have the experience of. It's just it's a lot. I know. <laughs> I know. I think I try to remember that the most important thing for my kids is that they feel loved and that they feel mm-hmm. secure, that they know that even if they make mistakes or are mean to each other or whatever, that their mother loves them. I feel like I've spent a lot of time stressing about what's going to be best for them, especially navigating divorce, separation, and touring, and the absence yeah. of my physical presence is a recurring source of tension in my life, both internally and in my co-parenting relationship. And that is really hard. I do not like to be far from Mm -hmm. my children. Ultimately, if they know that they're loved and they know that mom needs to do this work to be who she is, to keep on providing the love that I give them and that they receive, that's the most important thing. And I'm starting to care less about 
whether they can speak French, though my daughter is like <laughs> speaking French and it's amazing, you know? So mm-hmm. it's just like, sometimes you have to stick with things to see if they're working or not too. I don't think that there's a perfect system for anything. I think that when I was like earlier in my parenting journey and when I was imagining what life would be like with kids, I didn't imagine myself doing it alone. And I imagined that I was going to make all the right decisions and always know what to do. And I was going to have all the abundance and all the money to be able to bring the kids on the road whenever I wanted. And now I'm like, y'all are expensive. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I should not afford four extra plane tickets. That is not in the budget for any of my tours. And so the question of what is best for the kids and what is best for me feels tricky. And it also begins with them feeling that they are securely attached to their parents and loved unconditionally. Just a little bit ago, you mentioned in regard to your traveling, you said they know that mom needs to travel for work and to be who she is. When you're talking to them, like, this is what I do. This is how I express who I am. Is that the kind of language that you use around? Yeah. Delilah toured with me and her father when she was very young. And so she kind of knew the routine, you know. She was like one of those two-year-olds who was just like, where's the green room? I want a snack, you know, (laughs) on the road. Mm -hmm. And we just brought her everywhere for the first few years of her life. And so she got to know the routine and she has an idea of what I'm doing when I am at work because she experienced that. I also traveled with the twins for the first 16 or so months of their life. They just grew up knowing like, oh, my mom is a singer. Actually, their teacher at school plays them a lot of my videos. And so they see me at school too. And they know my songs. Mm -hmm. And on the way to school, they were especially when I was listening a lot to my last record, my son Zaid would be like, I want mama's music this morning. (laughs) And so that was really cute. (laughs) On the way to school, we'd be playing mama's music, you know. I think past two weeks starts to feel really long on the road to me. There's just no foolproof system for figuring out how long is too long or how short is too short. It's hard to go to Europe and not take all the dates, you know, and I feel like our life is chasing dates. It's like we don't always get to choose when it's convenient. No one's like, when's spring break? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. When's fall break? (laughs) Like the next parent teacher day, we'll plan it for that so that you can drive and bring the kids. Like, no, it doesn't work like that. So there's just no perfect system. And I think that really internalizing that for myself, I think is how I help my kids survive life because there is no perfect Mm -hmm. system for really anything in life, you know? And I feel like we often feel as musicians like, or I have felt often like no one understands what this means and what this is like. And it's true, but Mm -hmm. really no one understands each other. We're all kind of living in this super individualistic society where we're just taught that we have to become self-reliant. So I think that it's really hard to understand anyone's perspective. And that's why I chose this path, because I really love my work. And it's a big part of why I feel like I'm alive. It's a big part of why I feel like I'm on this planet. And I kind of feel like if you're not living your truth, whether you talk about it or not, your kids are just aware of that. It's an energetic yeah. thing. The idea that we can yeah. shelter them from the experience that we're having. Even when I'm upset about something, it's my own mother has been very present in my life recently. She's living in New Orleans. You know, when I'm upset about something, I walk in the door. She's like, what's wrong? There's just like a good connection between our kids and ourselves that mm-hmm. we feel each other's energy. And so it's tricky because I feel like there's always so much pulling on me. And maybe you feel Mm -hmm. that too. I have this many emails to respond to. I have this many songs that need to be written. I have these things that I've said yes to. I got to figure out how to fit in in the schedule. I got to figure out the support that I need. There's never enough time. Yeah, there is not. (laughs) Are there certain tools or approaches that you've found that are helpful for you to like either carve out that time or to be able to switch between parent mode and artist Mm -hmm. mode quickly because right now I'm just white knuckling basically. I need to do this now. I'm doing it and it's kind of by brute force versus tact or skill. You're much further into the process than we are. So I'm wondering if there's anything you found that helps. I think that earlier in my parenting experience, I would always be trying to do too much 
at the same time and get really mm-hmm. frustrated. And I think in the past year, past couple of years, really learning about the value of being fully present with my kids, because if they're getting all of me or 85% of me in a moment, 70, 85%, then they are less likely to be like anxious and needy, (laughs) you know? But if they are getting me distracted, looking at my phone, responding to emails, doing this or that while I'm trying to distract them with TV or it ends up creating more problems. So that's something that I've been working hard at, you know, and we have little things that we do, like there's a little community garden plot and Zayd and Zaya, my twins just got their bicycles. So we'll bike down to the garden and water the garden and weed for a little bit. And then we come back and then they're like more calm and I can like write a Mm -hmm. couple emails or take a shower. But yeah, I really feel that especially because I am not always physically here I really need to be emotionally and mentally available to them Mm -hmm. for this to feel sustainable in any way. And that's work that we have to do on our own, you know, as parents. And and it's not easy, you know, it's not easy because there's endless distractions and there's endless things pulling on us. And, you know, and our kids have that too. They need that connection and that focus. I really believe that children do not do what we say they do what we do. So I can't say focus on this thing if I can't focus on this thing at all myself, (laughs) you know, or stay calm if I can't even stay calm or whatever the issue (laughs) is, you know, like I can't say don't be mean if I'm being mean. I think that there's a lot of that kind of hypocrisy that a lot of us have grown up with where like the paradigm is shifting. We know better Mm -hmm. now what our kids need to be happy and healthier people. I've also been thinking like, is it possible to have a life without trauma? I don't no. think so. <laughs> no. So I'm just no, letting go of the idea that I can control exactly yeah. who they're going to become, what they're going to absorb. And so I focus on the things that I want them to be able to remember. You know, we cook a lot together. We bake a lot. We go to the farmer's market together, things like that. Yeah. Well, I think also that presence that you were talking about, we would all benefit from practicing without right. children. But I feel like on tour, especially, and in life for me before children, you're just on your phone mm. constantly, especially on tour because you're like riding in a car or van and like... Looking at your phone, you answer emails constantly. I never had designated times to respond to things. It was just whenever I looked at it and I would think, oh, I should respond to that later or I'll respond to it now. And I'm learning that's actually not efficient and it's not healthy for my brain and then it's not healthy for my child. So having more like compartments of even this is the time that I can veg out and scroll social media and I'm not going to just do it randomly through the day because I'm not even aware of how constant that happens and that this little child is looking up noticing that I'm giving more attention to my phone than looking at her reading a book. And I think we don't know the impact of that because this is so new and it feels really important to be conscious of not doing that in front of our children. I'm feeling very called out right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I oh my get, God. I get we, literally called we, out well, all the time. We call each other out yeah. all the time because we're like, okay, this is something that we should be conscious of and let's not do this. And then we'll see the other person doing it after we've just been right. doing it for like 20 right. minutes. And then we're like, hey, right. you know, you're really on your right. phone a lot. And then the other person's like, uh. Oh my God, it's so hard when it's just me and I'm just like, oh my God, you guys need to get me some space. But I yeah. also yeah. like, okay, okay, you're not needing space right now. How are we going right. to exactly. negotiate this? I grew up in a, Haitian American family. I believe my parents respected me, but they did not come from a culture where children were like equals at all. And maybe right. children are not equals. I'm not saying that's necessarily appropriate, but it was like children were expected to behave all the time. I'm pretty like loose and have not been very structured historically. So parenting has made me reassess what that means and how that affects my kids to not have a plan for the day or structure or like be more organized. I always love that James Baldwin quote that says love is a growing up. And I feel like that is the essence 
of the parenting experience. It's like you love your children and they force you to grow up. They force you to face Mm -hmm. the unmet needs that you might have had. And they force you to really think about how you talk to them because then you start seeing them talking to other people like that or absorbing your habits. And I think in that becoming a parent and forcing you to grow up and also in your situation, having three children and being a single mom, so much of what requires you to be fully present and for lack of a better term, successful or thriving in that environment can feel contradictory to what we've learned is the culture of being a musician, Mm -hmm. which kind of has this like arrested development tendency in certain circles of the lifestyle of being a musician, of being a creative, of whenever the inspiration hits you and going with the flow and late nights, it can feel so in direct contradiction of what life with young children Mm -hmm. is. And I think what you said earlier about feeling like nobody understands, that's motivation for this podcast of sharing the things that we don't necessarily have opportunity as musicians to commune Mm -hmm. with and share not just the hardship, but sometimes I think there's this feeling of like, oh, we don't want to share the hardship because we want other people to think we've got it together. We're progressing and we also don't want people to think oh God, they're struggling. So we don't want to invite them mm-hmm. to the festival or to on this tour or whatever because they look like a hot yeah. mess. And how to develop more opportunities, especially as still artists, still musicians don't want to be relegated to their house and forbidden from touring and making contributions. How do we create more opportunities to share these things and also ways to help each other mm-hmm. in it and be more open and accepting of this is... Life, this isn't a burden that you have three children and that's a part of having Layla as part of this art. That's not like a negative. That's actually incredibly enriching to who you are and not an inconvenience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard because you don't know where people are coming from. Some people have that perspective, you know, and some people are just like, whoa, that's crazy. (laughs) Like I tell people sometimes that I have three kids, their face like completely transforms. And I'm like, oh, that's how mm-hmm. you feel about that. Well, I think it's also still a new concept for a mother to have multiple children and be the one that's leaving home and out mm-hmm. there creating and traveling. I think it's been very common for fathers to have a lot right. of children. People always say, who are the kids with? I'm like, their yeah. dad. Their dad yeah. is very involved <laughs> in their lives. And that's always like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is interesting. I'm like... I've had nannies before, but really the kids want to be with me or their dad. I think our society, we have to create the change that we want to be, which I feel like in a lot of ways is we're the pioneers of this for the arts community, which is never going to be a completely comfortable position because there's so much unknown, there's so much unchartered. But I do feel like one of the reasons why I've chosen to live a creative life is that there is a lot of magic in it. And there is a lot of coincidence and serendipity and community and thinking outside of the box. And those things are really important to me in my life. And I think that they are going to be increasingly important to the world that our children are inheriting. Being able to be part of community and also feel empowered to become a parent. I want to be part of a world where There is a lot of agency around how you build your life and that you're not just being plugged into a system. Um, And that's something that I like about the way that I've been able to build my career is that it doesn't feel easy all the time. It doesn't feel easeful, Mm -hmm. but I do have all these systems of accountability for showing up for myself and my creative practice. I have created the momentum to have opportunities that have me part of research projects or collaborations or bigger things that have felt greatly enriching to my experience as a human being. And to be able to pass that to my kids or exhibit that for my kids, I think is just such a gift. There's times when I've wanted to like work a nine to five job and like feel less in uncharted territory. But Mm -hmm. I think that's just a farce. Like we're all in uncharted territory, whether you work a nine to five or not. I mean, think of all the people who were laid off during the pandemic. That was like a real moment for me of realizing, oh, my God, 
I have a career. I am not sinking. And a mm. lot of people did. You know, feeling. a lot of people did. And they were doing the things that they were told they should do in order to have security. And I don't feel like I can talk about my life as a single parent musician without realizing that we're all kind of under this neo-colonial capitalist system. My approach to my life has been that I have to actively work to dismantle that. And part of it is the in invisible labor of parenting and nurturing children and raising children and exhibiting other ways of existing in this world and in this society. Absolutely. Tying back to what you were saying about the pandemic, I had that paradigm shift for myself during the pandemic as well. I was like, oh, what I've created, what Michaela has created as a career for ourselves, the world can shut down and we can continue mm -hmm. on. And it got me really thinking about these people that have been plugged into, I don't know, stereotypically like the corporate pipeline mm -hmm. of go to school, maybe go to more school, graduate, get a job, work, build your retirement and then retire. All these people get laid off and then what do they do? And then you see a lot of people in our community, one arm of our business shuts down, you know, touring gets pulled out from underneath us. But then there are all these other things. There's this flexibility and this creativity in different outlets that makes it very malleable and very sustainable in a way. We all know it can be very hard to make it financially yeah. sustainable, but that creativity and that flexibility in a profession is actually a really sustainable thing. Yeah. I think the question is, are you capable of shifting with what the shift is, right. you know, right. because the business, I think, is always changing. I think probably a part of why this podcast that you're creating exists is because we don't live in a culture that believes that everyone deserves health care that women should have full agency and autonomy over their own bodies. There are kind of systems of oppression that we are all navigating, that most of our budget goes towards the military. Our priorities as yeah. a society is not nurturing children to live creative lives. So that's why we're swimming upstream. And I don't know if that's going to change in and of itself without the mm -hmm. larger societal shift. I never thought of it the way that you said part of your intent to try and dismantle the capitalistic oppressive system that we have is through the invisible labor of raising new humans and modeling to them that there's a different way to live. And I never really thought about it that way of, oh, we're planting seeds and growing this new type of crop to like go into the world and create a new system. In that way, it's really important for us to raise children. It makes me think of Iris Dement. Have you listened to Iris Dement's new I've, record? I've heard uh, snippets of it. Okay. I feel like you would love it. It's incredible. And she has a song. It's very overtly commenting on political, social mm -hmm. justice, everything that's happening. She has a song called Working on the World. I think that might be mm -hmm. the name of the record. But it's all about working on a world that I might never mm -hmm. see and for the next generations. And I think... These conversations are what help fertilize those seeds for all of us of there's different ways to live. Even when we choose these alternative paths, we have to do a lot of mental work and a lot of labor to try and stay in our paths and not be pulled into the quote unquote normal systems or why still people don't think what we do is a real job. People always refer to like, oh, do you have a real right. job? But sharing stories and ways to do it is what helps people feel supported. And I go back all the time to you and I met when your oldest, Delilah, was like three <laughs> months old. I opened like a two-week tour for you guys and you were you were driving around in a minivan with your husband and your mm -hmm. bass player and your three-month-old baby. And I remember you said... That when you got pregnant, you knew you didn't think, oh, I have to give up my career because you had toured with Rhiannon Giddens and the Caroline mm -hmm. Shock Drops and you saw Rhiannon do it with mm -hmm. two children. So you knew it was possible. And then you did it. And I also played shows with Birds of Chicago, Allison Russell and JT and formerly Mandolin Orange. I saw all these examples of people making it work with babies that then made me think every time the greater narrative of that's is impossible how are you going to keep being a touring musician with a child I was like no I know mm -hmm. it's possible and I always think of that chain of you seeing it firsthand then me seeing it firsthand from you and that support and how valuable 
texting you throughout this last <laughs> year of like, how do I leave for five days when I'm still nursing? And how do I do this? And like the invaluable support of other parents on this path and other mm-hmm. mothers sharing what this does to our bodies and like knowing that I'm not alone and there's like tricks that is yeah. massive. And that's part of just like these conversations are important to not try and always just cope alone mm-hmm. and share. Not that it's just a mm-hmm. bitch fest or an area to vent and wallow in how mm-hmm. hard this is, but to feel seen in the struggle and then therefore support each other in the struggle. Yeah, I think it's really hard for me to remember that I'm not alone sometimes, you know. Mm-hmm. Everything is like a practice and we have to practice being appreciative of the things that we have. We have to practice continuing to be open to things that we want, despite the fact that they might feel impossible or far off. We have to believe that we can have an empowered life in order to be able to follow through with it. You know, I really do believe it begins with faith because of course, I'm like, yeah, Rhiannon Giddens had kids and, you know, I know it's possible and I knew it was going to be possible for me. I still don't know how. Yeah. And my kids are like <laughs> starting to be older kids, you know, <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah. I ask myself all the time, how is this going to work? How is this going to work? How is this going to work? Because I'm going to make it work because mm-hmm. I have, because yeah. I'm also not the first and I'm not the last, you know, I'm part of a long line of people who are charting different ways to exist and different ways to raise really good people. You mentioned that you have systems of accountability in place for your creative practices. Mm -hmm. And you do a lot of deeper multidimensional work beyond just writing songs and recording a record. Mm -hmm. Often there's an academic aspect to it. If you can kind of briefly share about your most recent project, but then also what are those systems of accountability to still be able to tackle these pretty ambitious projects and do them really well. Mm -hmm. So my latest project, it's called Breaking the Thermometer. And it's an album that I made based off of a theater work that I had been developing for the last five, six years. I was commissioned to create a multimedia theater performance based on the archives of Radio Haiti. My family is from Haiti. And so Haiti figures strongly in the things that I'm processing about the world and the things that I'm processing about history. I'm very interested in history and society and culture and kind of the intersections between all those things and figuring out how they affect us today. So I did a lot of research at this archive, learning about the lives of journalists in Haiti in the 70s and 80s and 90s who really risked their lives to be able to tell the truth about their countrymen and learned a lot about the tragedies and triumphs and how important it is that we exercise freedom of speech and have an an independent press as a part of any sort of democratic process. And so Mm. been thinking a lot about those things. I think the whole world has been thinking a lot about those things over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. When I started the project, it was under the Trump administration and studying the Duvalier regime. It's like, whoa, there's a lot of like authoritarian parallels here. And then obviously now it's Biden. Journalists' lives are still being threatened throughout the world. And truth is a fragile thing that is often persecuted. Mm -hmm. Truthsayers are often persecuted, whether they be artists or intellectuals, academics, lawyers, journalists, for sure, all kinds of people in all different sectors of society. So that was my last project. But a lot of my work about my first record was released in tribute to Langston Hughes, and it was based on Langston Hughes's poetry and I just really love projects that require a lot of research. So I do a lot of reading in general. Oftentimes my projects are born of what I'm reading or listening to. So I enjoy doing that work. For that project in particular, I, first of all, was being commissioned by Duke University. That's a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. And then I assembled a team of collaborators who... We were in regular contact about all of these things. And as the lead artist on the project, I had a lot of say in how how things go and are presented and what the story is and was very much about building a narrative and being able to tell a story. And I just learned so much about that. And then on top of that, I have a label that's like 
when are you going to give us the masters? <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> I have managers that are like, what are the dates? You know, like, so when I say systems of accountability, I mean, I have deadlines, I have meetings, I have other people who are making mm-hmm. sure that the meeting is scheduled. Even this, you know, it was like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm going to show up and a bunch mm-hmm. of people know that I'm going to show up and we're going to make this happen, you know? And yep. so I feel like I have that at all levels of my career. I also recently accepted a position as an artist in residence at the University of Richmond in Virginia. Amazing. So Congratulations. Yeah, it's been really amazing. And so I visit twice per semester and speak with students and visit classrooms and talk a lot about my work. And I think that the momentum that I've built, at least if not on the commercial side, on the academics and research side has been super fulfilling for me and it keeps me yeah. motivated. And so to have a community of people who are just like really invested in a lot of the research that I'm doing or want to help me in some way and want to be a part of it, that has been a really amazing thing to see blossom over the last 10 years. Yeah. You mentioned your first record was based in Langston Hughes. Have you always created in this way where there's a research historical mm-hmm. background or were these two disparate parts of your being and your what you enjoy doing that kind of just fused naturally? I think that it has always been a part of my research. My solo career really started about 10 years ago when I left the Carolina Chocolate Drops. And I felt like that was always like me getting my master's degree, <laughs> like mm-hmm. touring mm-hmm. with them. I mean, I learned so many like life skills during that time, pre-kids, but also I think one of the biggest things I took away from that experience was that you can blend academic research with a music career, with performance. Being able to like really tap into that has been such a huge part of my experience as an artist. It's really grounded me in things that I'm truly passionate about. I just don't know if I will ever just create music that doesn't reflect something that I'm processing or reading about or want to know more about. I think the Carolina Chocolate Drops were obviously very influential in the folk music world for a number of reasons, but just the simple fact of pre-Carolina Chocolate Drops, there was not an accepted understanding of the banjo as an instrument that came to the United States as part of the transatlantic slave trade. That simple fact, it's not that long ago that people started to really absorb that and be able to talk about that. And the places that we would play were very often white spaces. And so the educational component of that was really impactful for me, you know, and it made me feel like That's how I can make this more meaningful for myself. I mean, I love music. I love being in the studio. I love putting sounds together too. But in terms of the generative process of writing a song or putting together a piece, the emotional core for me is often rooted in telling stories that are not told enough or have been excluded or or hidden for whatever reason. And I'm always just curious about that. And so that really drives me. And being in touch with that as a part of my process has also just really grounded a lot of my work in a way that feels very me. And I would imagine very purposeful beyond I could just be projecting my own struggles of ego with a music career. Your personal history and emotions and feelings are so intertwined with everything that you're writing about and is part of it. But there's this bigger purpose that's not just about your single feeling life, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm probably a lot of that comes from being a Black woman growing up in America from a Haitian family. Just a lot of questions about my identity my entire life, you know, like, where are you Mm -hmm. from? What are you? And feeling like, I never really fit cleanly into any boxes that our society asks us if we fit into these boxes. And I was always like, I don't know, like I've got a lot of different identities and a lot of different heritages. And of course, I identify as Black, but that feeling of not being so cleanly identifiable in one way and never being invisible because of that has been a big motivator for me too. And a big part of the way I've chosen to live my life. It's like, I never fit in any boxes. I was never made to fit in a box. I was always made to create my own box in my own way. 
it's fun to hear you say that because we just had Melanie Charles on our podcast. Oh, who, awesome. Do you know Melanie? I know of her. Her parents are Haitian and she was born and raised in Brooklyn, but she was saying the same thing about really having to come to terms with and step out against basically being told what box do you fit mm-hmm. in? Like, why do you not fit it in this box? And a lot of her work and her process is, I don't fit in that box and I don't want to fit in the box that you tell me that I should fit mm-hmm. in. I am multifaceted. I relate to that and I have to remind myself of it regularly because I'm always like, why am I feeling insecure? Oh, because it's that thing where I'm suddenly feeling like I'm not sure that I can do it the way that other people are need it to be done. And even if that's not being asked of me, you know what I mean? It's like such mm-hmm. a practice to yeah. um, deconstruct that way of thinking. Well, and I think because there's this greater message, whether you hear it directly or overtly on a daily basis, but within American culture, I feel like we want everybody to fit into a box very neatly. Mm-hmm. And then there's even like the next level of being a black woman in America where as a white person, my perception is that our greater American idea is black is one thing. There's this one African-American idea that every person who has dark skin fits mm-hmm. under. And the work that you're doing is combating that narrative and explaining no, there's so much rich, nuanced, very different history, cultures, countries of mm-hmm. origin, so much bigger than our main narrative in America wants to recognize or has shown much interest in. Yeah, and knowing. I think part of that for me is that it begins with the education system, which is maybe why I'm so drawn to academic projects because our education has been, oh my God, I was dying last week, y'all. Delilah came home. She's like, we're learning about colonialism and the Native Americans. And I said to her, Delilah, you know, there's Native American people still exist and they're still part of our world. This isn't just the past. It isn't just Mm -hmm. what you're being told Mm -hmm. at school. But I was also just kind of like, really? Like, is this really still where we're at? I think in some states we're trying to go even Oh, back. my God. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yes. Tennessee being yeah, one of Tennessee, them. Yeah, Tennessee, Florida. I mean, the outlawing mm. of books. I feel that there is a lack of intellectual curiosity and an acceptance of the Western European perspective. And also, just like with my kids, I can't just say what I believe and say what I think. I have to actually live those principles. I actually have to show up Mm -hmm. for what my ideal is in my life. And I have to create my life out of that, not just my art, but my actual life, the way I live my life. And I think that that's also why artists are so important, you know, because they do give us a way of seeing the world just by their mere existence and the way that we've been able to craft lives that are not status quo. Yeah. That's a beautiful way to end because we're <laughs> we mm-hmm. want to be conscious of your time. I will say Eric Ward, who is a incredible social justice activist, he was the director of Western State Center and a Southern Poverty Law Center fellow, and I met him because of you because he was a friend of your oh father's my God. and came to the show in New York that I opened for you like back in uh-huh. 2014. Long story short, he always says. Artists are so important in social justice and social change because artists have the ability to imagine a new world Mm -hmm. and communicate that. That's what it feels like you just said. That's what I'm trying to say. (laughs) Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm like, don't kill my imagination, (laughs) please. (laughs) Jesus. The daily practice of staying committed to that and remembering your value in that. Yeah, in yeah. a world that doesn't always <laughs> value artists, yeah. you know. It's yeah. we have to mm-hmm. value each other. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we know your time is very precious, so we don't <laughs> want to take any more of it. I've been loving these conversations cuz we could talk forever with so many people. I feel like we just scratched the surface with you, but thank you so much for giving us your time and being here with Absolutely. us. Absolutely. I appreciate you wanting me to be a part of this. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Other 22 Hours podcast. You can find more info on this episode, including links to things that we talked about by going to theother22hours.com and clicking on episodes. We want this show to be a resource for our community from our community. So we'd love to hear from you about what works and what doesn't. Please let us know by sending an email to info at theother22hours.com. And we'll see you back here next week for another episode.